Hey, kids, how would you like to hear this on the screen instead of the great show you came to see? Hello, everyone, and welcome to Cinema Cataclysm. Today, we're talking about Deathbed, the bed that eats. Yes, welcome back to another episode. <laughs> I can't believe we've been doing this podcast for years now. Yeah. <laughs> so many good recent episodes. Unfortunately, nobody's, call- nobody's called us with any voicemails about our hottie and the naughty discussion. So- this is the Tyson and the Earthquakes of... <laughs> what? <laughs> The what of the what? I don't understand what you're saying. So we, uh, yeah, we're talking about Deathbed, the bed that eats people. And this is a very important movie, I feel. What's under the table? It's spooky. Because we're doing a horror movie for Shocktober. It's Halloween season. That's right. So um, this is, I feel this is an important movie in the history of our love of bad movies. Okay. Explain. Now, as I say this, we already know as we talked about throughout the week that it's no longer actually it's it's it wasn't what I thought it was because you didn't actually remember this or you haven't actually ever seen this movie. I have not actually seen this movie before. This is what happened. <laughs> this movie is famous or infamous because of the Patton Oswald stand up routine, which we'll play later on his CD Werewolves and Lollipops from like 2007. He talks about how this movie had just come out on DVD and how, and this is all true, he talks these facts about how this movie was filmed in in the 70s and was never released and finally was released to the public on a DVD. It was released in 2003. This stand-up routine is from 2007. Yeah, it was like shot in 74 or something and then released in, uh, allegedly released, completed in 77. Shot in the early 70s, completed in 77, never fully released to the public, never actually screened. Somehow, though, it ended up on bootleg tapes and had an underground fame. And then it wasn't until the internet came around that the director, George Barry, was like searching somehow about, I guess, you know, Googling himself or whatever you do in the early 2000s. (laughs) Right. And found a discussion forum about Deathbed, the bed that eats, and was like, oh, people actually already know about this movie like it and i'm losing the money because it's all on bootlegs so he finally released the real product in 2003 on a dvd now as i was saying Pat oswald does a comedy routine did a stand-up bit about this that was on one of his 2007 cd and there's a lot to actually talk about but with that but specifically his stand-up bit is about how like this guy goes through has a horrible idea for deathbed the bed that eats <laughs> And he works through it because Patton Oswalt is like, I've written 10 screenplays that I give up on, but this guy actually got this horrible idea, not only completed writing it, but like got to set and people were hired and people were cutting bagels and <laughs> brewing coffee <laughs> to have the fuel to make Deathbed the bed that eats. Now, as I say this, people who have heard the Patton Oswalt bit know, and we'll play a little bit of it later. Pat Oswald continuously in that 2007 stand-up routine calls it deathbed, the bed that eats people. <laughs> it's not called the bed that eats people. It's it is just the bed that eats. It's just the bed that eats. So it either eat, the bed eats some fried chicken. It yeah. eats an apple. Yeah. It eats a cross necklace. The bed eats a lot. It, yeah. It's a hungry bed. It has a. It, it, it eats <laughs> it so much. Been called the hungry bed. It has bed. a bottle of Pepto Bismol towards does. the end. So that. Pat Oswald bit, I think, gave this movie a lot of notoriety, whereas it would have been, it would have, it is definitely an, un, it's like a bad movie, horror movie, underground gem, like unseen, but the Pat Oswald bit gave it a lot of exposure. And in 2007, you and I certainly liked bad movies, and in, into 2010, when we got married, we certainly like liked bad movies. We liked looking for like kind of weird and funny movies, but we weren't full tilt into like really watching bad movies. Like by then, we'd seen The Room and all of these like movies, and, and these movies that are 
easy to watch if you like bad movies. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like the obvious bad movie things. So this one is one of the first one that got us kind of deeper, even though our even seeing it was because of exposure from a comedian. But I thought that Jessica had watched this with me back in like 2008 or 9 or 10 when I first watched it. As we're watching the movie, Jessica's like, no, I never watched this with you. So I guess it's hypothetical. I got this off Netflix and meant to watch it with you. And maybe you just didn't have the time at the time. And I watched it by myself and returned it. And then somehow I thought, as I always do, that you were there with me watching it. (laughs) This movie, sorry. And last thing is this movie is also interesting because to have a movie like nowadays we have Severin, we have Vinegar Syndrome and Agfa and all of these movie labels that just specifically find lost like movies that aren't really enjoyable by most moviegoers <laughs> right. and give them these like 2K and 4K restorations and these full Blu-ray things. This movie did that in 2000. It wasn't on one of those labels, but it did that in 2003. It was what is like it's like a proto version of now people that Vinegar Syndrome and Severin and all of these type Arrow. of movies. Arrow, yeah, these type of movies. I mean, Arrow even just specifically releases like movies that had maybe a major release but have been completely forgotten, you know? Right. Whereas w- w- Vinegar Syndrome is literally like the bottom of the barrel bad right. movies. Like this would have been, <laughs> if this movie didn't get released in 2003 by the director, seeing he had a chance to cash in on all those underground bootlegs, this is a movie that would have ended up on Vinegar Syndrome by now. Oh, yeah, for sure. So let's get into it. So we should have gotten... There's a Blu-ray le- release of this, and we right? And we should yeah. have gotten that, because as the... the Amazon, liked, It's on Amazon Prime. If you want to watch it. It's on YouTube, uncopyright <laughs> claimed. As the title, like, as the credits are rolling, we're like, oh, this is in 4-3, and some of the credits are cut off. So clearly... Yeah. <laughs> and it looks really dark and bad. So I don't know if the Blu-ray actually is good, or if it's just the 4 by 3 Like, I don't know... What versions of what like film elements of this movie remain? Is the blue does the Blu-ray look really good? So we'll have to check out the Blu-ray later and report back to you on next week's episode of Cinema Cataclysm <laughs> and let you know if the Blu-ray looks much better than what's on Prime. So lots of fun little effects in this movie. Um, honestly, I was hoping that this would be a little more Jess Franco-y. Some Jess Franco films are not good per se, but like She Killed in Ecstasy has really beautiful cinematography, and I was hoping it would be one of those 70s movies. Right. It is not one of those 70s movies, even though you think you're watching like a Dr. Pepper commercial from the 70s that's right. being played at your local drive-in. <laughs> it looks some of the very time. Yeah, early 70s. For sure. It looks like VD is for everybody. It does. hundred <laughs> percent. So um, we and, should... And the exteriors, shot day for night. They had right. to have been shot day for night. Well, let's give the basic premise of the movie. Okay. Because when I hear a term deathbed, a bed that eats, in parentheses, people, I would think <laughs> there's a certain type of movie that comes... You, like, you think like 80s teenage... You know, I know this is from the 70s, but you'd think like uh, 80s teenagers that show up and party and they get on the bed and then they disappear and they get eaten by the bed and then some people investigate later but no this is a very dreamlike movie yeah it's very dreamlike it is not you're thinking freddie's like gloved hand is coming through and pulling johnny depp down into it and the blood's coming out and yeah not not what i even wondered as i was rewatching this for the first time in like 10 years i was like was did what did this inspire Johnny Depp's death from Nightmare on Elm Street? And I'm like, no, it couldn't have because unless I guess Wes Craven hypothetically could have gotten a bootleg copy. Not once I realized bootleg copies existed for decades. But so, yeah, what you have is it's got this weird gothic framework. It's not like an 80s slasher or even a 70s slasher premise of a deathbed mo- of a bed monster that you lay down in the bed and it eats you. What you got is this dumb gothic thing where there is a dead the ghost of like an 1800s artist (laughs) stuck in the wall of a castle and it's his torment to watch this evil bed devour people when they come to lay in it so it's a castle that's abandoned for generations and some a 70s couple shows up and they're like hey we got a picnic with us and we're gonna break into this old castle and we're gonna do it in the castle right 
the the bed apparently can control the walls and like the locks so it purposely like locks the doors on the castle and makes them eventually get to his room where the bed is so the bed has somehow half We don't control. see that though. No, we it's see just that. Like, we see the locks locking. We see stuff. the locks locking, but like we're outside and then the couple is just teleported into this Right, room. it just cuts them finally into the room. But that was the idea that the bed controls right. the castle somehow and gets them into his room. They get on the bed they start making out. She's she keeps literally going back and forth between hot and cold instantly. It's, she's like a shower that someone is upstairs using the shower because she goes she goes she's like no let's not do it right now and then she's instantly like yeah let's do it and then she's like no let's not do it and that's her prerogative but that's what keeps going on. Eventually they put their picnic on the bed like the, there's fried chicken. There's fried chicken. Yeah, it's like it's the best seventies picnic ever. <laughs> These two, like, 30-somethings, even though the guy's in, like, a Letterman jacket, they are clearly in their 30s and don't have their own beds to get frisky in. Right. And I love that he, the guy brings a candle and some apples and a bottle of wine and a bucket of fried chicken. Like, yeah, baby, I want to make this special for you. (laughs) Right. (laughs) What? Because that's the trope about, like, 70s and 80s slashers is that horny teens can't do it in their homes because their parents are home so they need to find places out in the world to do it and that leaves them exposed to the killer right it's a trope as old as time but like you said these are 30 somethings this is like when we did our episode on uh, drive-in massacre <laughs> and like that was a, that was an 80s slasher but the the writer of that movie like messed up and made all the people actually adults with adult problems. It was problems. so depressing. It was like a married couple that were like, "Yay, we're pregnant," and the killer kills them. Yeah. What? Why? They and weren't like, doing anything wrong. And like they were another, just having a nice night out at the movie. Yeah, and like another couple that's like arguing over their relationship, and they're like forty <laughs> years old, and the killer kills them. So yeah, thirty something. They look like teenagers. And I don't know if I sold this enough, but it is like a decrepit, empty, castle building, right? And Except that there is... A made bed in the middle of one room and a fireplace. And a drawing, a painting. One painting. Of said bed. Nobody's ever gone in and like the, the whole place is empty, but no one's ever gone in and stolen the painting. No yeah. one's ever, I mean, I guess... No one's I ever guess the wondered bed wouldn't why allow it. the sketch is there. I guess like... the bed wouldn't allow it. But also, when people show up in this room to do it and then get eaten by the bed, they never question, like, here's an obviously decrepit, abandoned castle, <laughs> but here's this one room <laughs> with linens and everything, and they're fresh. Like, nobody wonders who came in and made the bed or why are the linens fresh. So they lay on the bed... Why do they even want to lay on the bed? If it's an old bed. Yeah. Sometimes when we are like traveling and so like there's this place called Pedro South of the Border, which is sort of an unfortunate place, but also really kitschy and kind of fun and decrepit in South Carolina. It's like right on the border of North and South Carolina. And they have this old motor lodge. And I was like obsessed with this. And my parents would never like let us stay there because they're like, no, it's gross. (laughs) And I really wanted to stay there. So this one time Danny and I were on the East Coast on a road trip. And I was like, Danny, can we please stay here? We get into the room and we were like, we are sleeping in all of our clothes on top of the bed. So like really gross. Imagine just like going to the worst, you know, kind of flea bag motel. You're going to wear all your clothes like you're not going to want to lay in the bed per se. It's not exactly inviting. So if I were wandering around and just came across this castle, I don't think I'd really be like, ooh, let me lay down on that bed. That was March 11th, 2011 that we stayed there. You know how I know? Because it was the day (laughs) of the big Japanese earthquake in 2011. Oh. Because that's when we got in, because we had been traveling, we turned on the news and they're talking about the Japanese earthquake. So the bed finally eats the first couple and they're basically just the setup like we're not gonna wonder worry about them later i almost wonder if this was basically a short film version the first 10 minutes are essentially like maybe a short film he shot and then later fleshed it out into an extra 60 minutes because the movie is only like 70 minutes and the the first couple is completely self-contained the way it Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so it's like this yellow bubbly bile comes up. And while the people are getting frisky, it's it starts by eating the, the their like little sad picnic. Right. And it pulls the things underneath. It, it plays in- a joke on them. <laughs> yeah. Because it takes the apple down. And then it, you cut to what's like basically the camera shooting like a clear vat 
of bile colored liquid, right? And the apple comes in. And I think in some cases they actually probably filled it with real acetone or acid and really let some of like the things like shoes and food actually dissolve in that. But other times there's actors in there who aren't, obviously they didn't dip real actors (laughs) in acetone. So that must be some sort of like yellowy orange liquid that they, and then they like act like they're dying or whatever. So, uh, yeah, so it plays a trick on them first. And the sense of humor in this movie is slow, but it's there. I mean, it's slow to appear, but it's there. It starts by, like, pulling down the apple, and it pulls down the bucket of chicken, and it pulls down the wine, and it eats all of these things. Like, the chicken they couldn't dissolve. Like, the chicken they actually use, like, a rudimentary, like, uh, stop-motion animation where, like, the bites magic just kind of, like, dip, dip, the bites, like, disappear in a flash from the chicken and it puts all the things back up on the bed, right? It, it <laughs> then pushes them back up to the top. So then when they open up their picnic, they're like, oh, the apple's eaten. Oh, the wine's gone. Oh, the chicken's gone. It must have been my mistake. So then they start like, and she's like, oh, don't worry. I wasn't hungry anyway. They start really making out. Suddenly all the tapestry around the bed closes and you hear them scream. Her arm falls out, but then gets pulled back in. We don't really see the first two people get killed, but we know they're killed. And then the bed opens back up and and act, end act one. <laughs> and I wonder why they didn't hear munching sounds. <laughs> right. <laughs> because the next scene, we like go back in time through. Our narrator. The, the, over the, the years. The spirit stuck in the wall, tormented by the murders that he has to watch. Go sends us to some stock footage of the 1920s, like real stock footage. With the newspaper flying up but, to, at the screen. Yeah, and bad newspapers they made. Like, I think they actually went and found some 20s newspapers, and then they badly, like, taped their own headlines across them. My favorite is that the newspaper is called the Daily Bugle. All like, right. this deathbed business, this is a job for Spider-Man. Right. <laughs> deathbed. Spider-Man's most fa- actually, you know, Deathbed's going to appear in the uh, third <laughs> Tom Holland movie. So, um, yeah, now we get the a general. We actually get the backstory through it. This movie really does have an interesting, like, proper structure because it doesn't give us all the info at the beginning. But at the beginning, it explains that the deathbed in the, like the 20s and the 1800s used to kill a lot more people because more people lived at the castle and people would disappear from the castle and no one understood. Then new buyers would come in and they'd all slowly start disappearing. Then it shows his headlines that like thousands, I think the writer got greedy or the production designer <laughs> who made this newspaper got greedy and said thousands disappear. So we're led to believe that this bed, that thousands of people have individually unknowingly laid in this bed and been eaten and more people and more people and more people keep arriving and laying in this bed and getting killed unless later i wondered if it was like the demon like guy we were getting ahead of ourselves but later we find out why the bed is evil it's possessed by a demon i'm wondering if the demon was out there getting people and that's what killed thousands of people and then later he was stuck in the bed at that point okay because they don't they don't use these flashbacks very well right. in that they're really scattered like to- like halfway through act two they just decide we're gonna take a break and we're going <laughs> to show you all the origins the secret the, the origin real stuff. secret origin yeah because we get a little bit of it now at the be- end of act one and by the way every act in this movie is called breakfast lunch <laughs> and dinner and we see them on screen in text and so, and spoiler warning, there's a four-act structure or an epilogue called Just Desserts. And I was like, oh, that's, you know, that's clever. I'd forgotten about that from the last time I saw it. So, yeah, it just gives us the general idea that the deathbed had killed a bunch of people in sort of oldie times. And no one ever figured it out. And they basically, like, closed. And no one ever wanted to buy this castle anymore. Then, uh, sorry, but I just want to say then, in the next act, the castle is gone. The castle is gone. And what I think happened, if you watch the movie, it's confusing because now we have a brand new set of like young people who come to the castle and end up in the deathbed room and they're all eventually going to get killed by the deathbed. But like, I think they lost the castle location between filming. So they just found some sort of decrepit looking like brick shed like a brick structure in the middle of a field that's all overgrown. And that's the best they could do. And they sort of through exposition of the ghost in the wall explain, and this is really bad, but I think the real explanation is they just couldn't get the real location back. That's 
the deathbed was angry and hungry, so he used his power to destroy the entire castle except for his room. Yeah, the vast majority of this movie is told through voiceover. Right. Just through narration, even from the characters on screen. Yeah, we like, switch narrators a couple times. Yeah, there's 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 very few times when you're actually having proper dialogue right. occur. And what's very confusing is that we are presumably somewhere in America and in a castle that dates back to, or at least the deathbed itself only dates back to the mid 1800s because they show a graveyard with the original family of the deathbed, Uh, which it's like all the gravestones say like 1845, I think, or like 1875. And I'm like, that's not quite far Mm. back enough. (laughs) So now, and this is why I think the first 10 minutes of the movie were basically a short film that he shot first because he couldn't get the castle back from his short film. And now the new next sec- next set of characters we're going to meet, some of them are going to die right away, but basically their story and the follow-up story all connect. So that's why. So the last three, the last three sections are all going to connect. Basically, we start with three women. And this is one of the moments where we switch narrator. We switch narrator away from the ghost in the wall, the artist in the wall, to one of the girls being like, I don't know why they let me come along on this trip. <laughs> I don't like being in the car and walking aimlessly <laughs> through the woods until we find a shack. And one of them is supposedly like, was it was one of the friends a real estate agent or was it no, no, so the an main, off-screen friend? Was it's an real- off-screen friend. The main girl who who is driving and bringing her friends out here is like, I just needed some time away from the city. Right. So I have this friend who's a real estate agent who is selling this 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 estate. This right, the castle. This, yeah, in the woods. And so she pulls up. She's like, well, it's supposed to be here, but there's nothing there right. but woods and like the empty sort of path that's supposed to lead to the estate. Right. And so she and one of the other friends get out of the car and start like wandering around looking for it. And the other girl just kind of we meander with her for a little yeah. while in that very 70s way. Yeah. Yeah. And the the incidental stuff is all just like they just they go in the cabin, they leave the cabin, they go in the cabin, the deathbed <laughs> sees them, they lay on the bed. It's just like a bunch of. Like, it moves, but it's like, it just doesn't get to it for a while, these three girls. And then the bed is, like, afraid of one of the girls, and the artist is telling us that in narration. It's like, you're afraid of that one woman. Why? (laughs) But they don't... By the way, they have to park away from where the castle was supposed to be, which is understandable. If, in the story, the castle has magically disappeared, sure, they're confused. They park somewhere. They walk to try to find it. But then when they park, they keep going back and forth from the car aimlessly. They... Go to the cabin. They go back to the car. They go to the cabin. They go back to the car. They go to the cabin. Again and again. It's like, just grab all your stuff at once. Yeah. It's not like they have bags and bags and bags. And it takes forever for them to get from the car back to this one, like, room that is left. Except when it doesn't. Except when it's in a cut and it just instantly happens. They, like, leave and then they're back. And then they leave and they're immediately back at the car. They either teleport or it takes, like, 20 (laughs) minutes. Right. I started to lose the plot about halfway through when during those those flashbacks, um, a prostitute and her like snake oil salesman pimp decide. All right, and then we flash back, and now the the guy in the wall gives us the real backstory of the bed. Right, but it's like completely out of order. Right. So these people decide to move the bed outside and claim that it has healing properties or something, and like the bed allows this and does not eat the prostitute. Or her, like, pimp boyfriend guy. Right. Until <laughs> they rent the bed out for an orgy. Yeah. And then the bed decides just to eat all of them. The bed was very clever. <laughs> the bed knew, like, hey, this snake oil salesman and his prostitute girlfriend are bringing me people. And this is a one moment of, like, of like a clear plan that the bed has. Because most of the time, the artist in the wall is narrating that the bed is stupid and hungry and just doesn't think about his plans. But this is the one moment where he had a plan where he didn't kill the people so he would so that the, they would bring the mother load of people and they all get in the bed to have an orgy. And it's funny because they don't show an orgy. They just show like... They must the have blankets put a, They pull the blankets yeah. bouncing under the bed. <laughs> so this... It's around the time of the multiple flashbacks in the middle where we get like some of all the history of the bed and all the different people it's killed actually showing us actors portraying getting killed like an old 
like a like a, there's an old pre like an old pastor from the early yeah there's a priest with his his Gideon's hotel bible right. that wait, wait, and, and like one of those even... handlebar mustaches yeah they imply that it's killed children but they don't show that I mean at least it has at least the filmmaker like had the you know he kind of held back on that but they show like a child's toy falling in the thing and, and breaking apart and on the toy it said what did it say it said oh, um, Mitzi for president or something or like, Millie uh, <laughs> it was it was whomever uh uh, whoever, FD, whoever lost FDR, right? Yeah, um, and that was Wilkes supposed to, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> and that was supposed to let us know the time frame of when it must have killed that child. And the the absolute best of these flashbacks, though, is there's these two gangsters who are like hiding out in <laughs> right. this area and they're playing cards. And when the one starts to get eaten, he pulls his gun out and starts shooting, shooting down at, the, at bed, the bed. But it just looks like he's shooting at his crotch right. as like he slowly melts into the bed. Right. And that's one of the moments also of like random magical realism that this bed also has. Because once in a while it has powers beyond just you lay in it and get dissolved. That In that moment they're playing cards and somehow the bed magically changes the cards to say, I'm going to kill you tonight. <laughs> yeah, it says, the, like, you are dead or yeah. something like that across each one of the cards. And he's like, hey, what's the big idea? Right. So, yeah, so we get all of that backstory, these little vignettes of all of these people through time who have been killed. And the and then we finally get the backstory of the artist in the wall. And he was, like, an artist who had tuberclu- tuberculosis. He had consumption. Tuberculosis. He had consumption. <laughs> yeah. And it was literally his deathbed. Like, he was placed in the bed by his family or whoever to die. And th- then he's painting from it. And in the last one, he's like, this bed's about to kill me. I somehow knew it was about to kill me. So I drew one last painting of the bed itself. And he draws really quickly, and it's the worst looking <laughs> shot because he's just holding a big piece of cardboard. Like he's going to go to a protest later and he's going to write, like, you know, a cab on it or something. But now he's actually drawing this, like, very intricate drawing of the thing. And then he dies, and the bed dissolves him. But somehow, because he was riddled with disease, it can't, like, it, it can't dissolve his soul, I guess. That part's not explained. But somehow, because he's riddled with disease, magically it puts his spirit in the wall behind and then someone had to have hung the painting up but somehow it puts him it puts him in the wall behind the painting he made of the bed real real loose loosey goosey magic and he's like oh man he sees that the like, when we go back to present day you he, like you see that one of the girls is smoking and the the artist in the wall is like oh man i haven't had a cigarette in 70 years and so all of a sudden the bed's like oh i'll kill this lady so that you can have the cigarettes and so right. later you see him smoking the cigarette oh that's right the bed can randomly decide the bed's the bed the the narrator in the wall the artist in the wall kind of says like i'm kind of like his toy he can he can be nice to me or not be nice to me but he gives me and he gives the bed gives all of the jewelry of his victims to the spirit in the wall <laughs> and that's the framing device around him explaining all the people he gets killed like he looks at each ring and jewelry on his finger so yeah so now we cut back to present day and it starts to kill the three ladies and we find out one of the ladies looks like so there was some like evil warlock guy or like demon guy or guy possessed by someone and he like haunted a family and he wanted to get with the mom or the sister that part so there's a demon okay that is the bed he becomes the bed and he wanted one of the daughters or something of this family who lived in this like castle thing or whatever and so he it's a little muddled but he like wants to and seduces her however he kills I think he's her still or something a, during he's sex still, because he's in a he's human a form he's in he a, human a human form. form because it's when they stab him and his blood gets on the bed that he possesses the bed yeah whatever it's a thing yeah and now that the bed has realized oh i was afraid of one of the girls because she looked like my lost you know girl that i was obsessed with and got killed and 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 put me in this bed i've i've dealt with that that was my therapy and now i can kill her (laughs) so it kills two of the girls um and then one's left and that one girl happens to have a brother that we cut away and he's gone out to look for her which is kind of odd that like she's just been gone for the day 
and he's going it's not like she's been gone for days or something it would have made more sense if she was like stuck if the like if it wouldn't unlock if the bed wouldn't unlock the door and wouldn't let her leave and she's been missing for days and then he goes looking for her yeah i guess they they try to to logic that with the first scene you see him in he's talking to their mother right and he's like, oh, I have to go after the world's oldest runaway. Like, <laughs> okay, so maybe this is the thing she does. She just disappears. Or and maybe it's Prince Spaghetti her. Night and they need her home. I don't know. It doesn't make any sense that like that moment. She just went out with some friends for the afternoon. <sighs> you can't file a missing persons report until it's been 24 <laughs> hours. But um, yeah, so he finds his way. He finds their car parked on the road. He walks through the woods. He finds the cabin. He gets inside. The girl who has seen her two friends, she only saw one of her friends killed by the bed. The one other girl got killed off, you know, while they weren't looking. Um, the death of the second friend is got down, <laughs> it annoyed Jessica for a while. Like the bed sucked her down, but then she actually escapes. And like her legs are supposed to be like half digested. But the only way they did that was by like splashing her legs with like, you know, that that 70s bright fake paint blood. And, and it takes crawls. her forever to, to crawl, crawl out, of the room. out of the room, out of the room, up to the stairs. And then we, we spend actually like started five minutes with her attempting to pull herself up this like set of like just five stairs up to the door that will get her out. And as soon as she finally gets the door open, the bed pulls her back. Right. With its it uses, it its, uses the sheet, the sheet, like a like a octopus. What do you call an octopus? <laughs> like tentacle. <laughs> And then that's when the other, the last friend comes in, sees the girl getting pulled into the bed, knows the bed's alive. The bed won't let her escape. The brother gets there. They come in. The brother immediately believes that the bed is actually a monster. Just accepts just it. Just accepts it immediately. He sees an eyeball rolling around on there. Oh, right. He's, and he's yeah. like... Oh, the, oh the your bed friend, ate the bed ate your friend. And right. it's like, oh, okay, you are very accepting <laughs> of this narrative. All right. He was a, he was actually, it was an, an unexplained uh, plot twist that he was a paranormal investigator. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then he's like. So he grabs well, a knife. Yeah, he's like, we've got to kill this thing. We've got to save your friend. So he grabs this really long Even though long she's already knife. been digested. Maybe he didn't realize that. Yeah, he grabs this really long knife that, because everyone in this movie brings the worst food to a picnic. <laughs> right. Because these We forgot to mention brought, the three. Yeah. Girls, we, we can only tell. We think they brought a whole loaf of bread, some uncooked potatoes, <laughs> cognac, <laughs> cognac, <laughs> and a jar of giant pickles. pickles, and another jar of what I thought might be pig's feet because it was like some sort of weird pink pickled thing. It was gross and odd, whatever Maybe pears it was. Or ginger. <laughs> Um, and a large knife, like a ridiculously <laughs> giant knife, right. like like a turkey knife or something. So the brother stabs. So now the two friends are dead. The brother stabs the bed and the bed sucks in his arms. And this is the absolute best part of the movie. And it actually shows this inside like of the bed, the hands dissolving. And when he pulls, it's pretty gross. But when he pulls them out, his hands are like mannequin toy skeleton hands skeleton hands he <laughs> has skeleton hands that was the absolute greatest thing ever i was like fuck yeah i love it skeleton hands then he goes and he and it, the the sister's in shock he goes and lays down again he goes and sits down against the wall the sister's there with him she's like blank eyed stared like can't deal with any of this he looks at his hand he just keeps staring at his hands and then his like individual bones keep falling off and he's like the what do you call it the 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 cartilage. Uh, the cartilage is gone the cartilage is wasting away it's better we take these hands off now which i'm thinking like why just let it fall off yeah it reminds me of that really bad really really bad gag in hostel where as the one guy who's escaping the death hostel is almost on his way out he finds one japanese woman who's in the middle of being tortured and she her eye was being like burnt out by the one of the other guys he hits that guy over the head and her eye is dangling out and he's like we got to cut your eyeball off before we can leave here like no you actually don't have to do that just kind of like maybe hold something against it and so he cuts her eye off before they leave and it's supposed to be gross but it's just so cartoonish and bad that's what it makes me think of like just let your hands fall off they fall they break them off they throw them in the fire <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> And there's no blood or gore or anything right, it's until, like Star after Wars. She, <laughs> until after she breaks them off. It's and like, then suddenly you see like the bloody stumps. Blood. Yeah. And there's a little bit. Of, yeah, it's like Star Wars. It's like a lightsaber attack. Like there's no blood, even though someone's been. Right. So, well, it cauterizes it, Dan. So in that final moment, now the bed for some reason like is is 
like beyond full and sick or something. So he goes, the bed goes to sleep. And in that moment, the artist behind the wall can finally talk to the one girl left. Well, the brother's still alive, but he's like out of it. The artist speaks to the girl and says, here's the plan. He gives her basically like a ritual, like almost like a, you know, demonic ritual. Like she has to write in blood on the ground and she has to get some, she has to get her brother's bones and use them like chicken bones and all of this like mystical seventies witchery. First, first she takes her brother out of the place, which I, she just, I guess she like dumps him on the road. Right. But then she has to, Without she takes hand. him out and she takes him by where she has to make another like a, a circle of wood outside. Right. And so she puts him over there. And, and we don't see him again. Oh, we do see him again. We do? Yeah. Okay. I forgot. Well, now she gets back into the thing. She gets back into the into the stone hutch, <laughs> the, the stone fortress, the tiny fortress. She s- lights the stuff on fire, and now, like, the circle traps, I guess, the deathbed's ghost inside the thing. And I think it teleports them back outside? No. She's stuck there, and the man in the portrait is like, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you this, but you have to die now. You have to sacrifice yourself in right. order to take care of the deathbed. Right. And so that is the last we see of her. He's like, you have to die so that this original woman can be reborn from her grave right and then right that woman i forgot resurrects his first victim when he his last victim before he became a bed comes back to life and when she comes back she needs to consummate this for reasons so oh. she drags the brother into the middle of the, the burning bed the, the wood circle oh, that is wood now circle. like on fire i missed this i yeah. must have been distracted <laughs> and she starts to get get like freaky with him and oh, so I forgot this. <laughs> the artist gets to disappear and move on to the afterlife yeah. he gets to find peace now and the deathbed is destroyed the end the end. And that last section was called Just Desserts. And um, yeah, that's Deathbed. Do we recommend it? <laughs> it's, you know what? I actually really love all the like, that like, the, the the stomach acid portion of when you see the bed digesting the different things. It reminds me of like a Lana Del Rey music video. I love that part. <laughs> so I think that if you like like weird 70s stuff definitely check with, it like, out like an artsy touch this yeah. is like pro- but nowadays we have heightened horror with like hereditary this is like proto heightened horror because by the way i didn't mention it but the director if it has like a, if, if everything we described has a weird dream logic it's because it's literally based on a dreams on dreams that he had which you can kind of tell it has that dream logic because like why does everyone keep coming here where's the bathroom in this place why would they want to spend the night there if there's no bathroom and no kitchen why throw the bones into the fireplace right you know yeah so yeah it is quite a movie and it's a classic because of Patton oswald so real quick let's play the Patton oswald bit not the whole thing but just the first part I'm trying to write movies. It's fucking hard, man. And it got even harder this year because they released a movie on DVD. It was made in 1977. They never released it. It just now got put out on DVD this year, and it's called Deathbed, The Bed That Eats People. I'm not making... Go IMDb this. This is a real movie. I should edit out the people part because it's not The Bed That Eats People. So the rest of this, when he says people, I'm cutting that out. Deathbed... The bed that eats, and it's about a bed that's evil and it eats people. That's the whole movie. And the backstory is it's like the 1500s, there's a demon, the guy kills the demon with the sword, the demon's blood gets on the bed, now the bed's possessed. Go to present day, 77, when people fuck on the bed, the bed kills them, because it's evil. That's the, that's the fucking plot. Is, is that it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, I've sold four different movies to four different uh, studios, and a lot of you are thinking, hey, you got it made, kid. Hang on, because when you sell a screenplay, you then go through a one-year notes process that will make you want to stab yourself in the eyes with your own dick that you've torn off, shellacked, and turned into a letter opener. That is how (laughs) insane, like, this guy wrote Deathbed, the bed that eats, took it to a second guy and said, okay, it's called Deathbed, the bed that eats. Now the backstory is, there's a demon, and then the second guy said, stop drilling, you hit oil. You had me at deathbed. 
We are going to rent cameras, buy film stock, hire a crew. We are shooting this masterpiece. And then he's like, people made bagels and made coffee to make this movie happen. <laughs> and I can't make my movies happen. So, um, yeah. And lastly, there's another movie called Deathbed from 2002 with Joe Estevez. <laughs> Classic cinema cataclysm mainstay, Joe Estevez. And it's credited as a remake of Deathbed, but I don't think it is my theory. And it's also Full Moon, which we talk about all the time. But they, I think they just made a movie which was also about a deathbed and wanted to call it Deathbed and then realized there's another movie that wasn't released until a year after the Deathbed 2002 movie. So they kind of probably had to credit the guy. You yeah. Know what I mean? because and has has some similar like sort of parallels. We haven't watched this movie, but right. we did watch the uh, the trailer and there's like the woman's an artist. So she's yeah. sketching the bed. So it's like, oh, there's also an it's artist mo- like yeah. angle there. It's more specifically a haunted bed that they find in their loft when they move in. And it doesn't seem to eat people. It just seems to kind of drive you crazy. And I think it makes this couple like not trust each other. And I think it might manifest some sexy ladies on top of it to make the like the husband <laughs> in the relationship cheat on her with like death ghosts in the bed or something because that seemed to be what was implied in the thing and then they're investigating was there a murder in the apartment it's not the same premise it doesn't eat people it's not even called deathbed the bed that eats it's just called deathbed so i don't think it eats anyone i think it's just a haunted bed but anyway that's deathbed and uh yeah this was obviously our oh, by the way sadie hawkins pod this was our April Fools, we've been talking about it, but we put it <laughs> off. We had to do it because as we've talked about, when we always mention Brady, our listener Brady as our corporate overlord, it's because in 2019 I sent a tweet out joking, should we do this movie instead of the song Deathbed? And Brady was like, yes, you have to do it. I'll send you money if you do. And I'm like, ah, oh, ha, ha, hilarious. And then suddenly I get an email that says, you've been sent $100 for Patreon. <laughs> and I'm like, what the f- <laughs> so I was like, well, I guess we have to do it. And then luckily Brady himself said, because of COVID, hey, don't do it on April Fool's. I'll understand. We we're like, cool. And I was like, we'll do it in episode six to nine. Woo! <laughs> so this, so we're really doing. We're 69 and in the deathbed. Oh my. <laughs> Jessica, we're out of cinema cataclysm now. Oh, oops. We're back into City oops. Hawkins spot. You can't make those oops. kind of jokes. So next week we're doing the real <laughs> part one of our real actual deathbed the reliant k song thing and then part two i wish that the reliant k song was about this movie just singing (laughs) about the plot of this movie that would be fantastic i can't i'm so confused by the plot of this movie that i couldn't actually replace the lyrics like well it was 1901 and i decided to eat an artist he was dying of consumption (laughs) right and I could smell his sickness on my sheets. <laughs> I can smell the foam on the sheets. <laughs> I'm the bed that eats. <laughs> there you go. So see you next week for our for part one of our real Reliant K Deathbed episode. <laughs> <laughs>